on February 2nd, 2010, I boarded a bus to begin an eight-day tour uh, for a documentary feature I had made called Neighbor by Neighbor. The video was a collaborative project with its subject, a group of community organizers in downtown Lewiston who call themselves the Visible Community. The documentary uh, serves as an autobiography of the group's four and a half year history, starting with the group's formation to resist an urban renewal plan that would have destroyed their neighborhood. After their first victory, the group went on to wage many more campaigns and build on their success to empower economically disadvantaged people to play an active role in city redevelopment policy. The tour was put together at the suggestion and with the help of Mike Jackson, a community member of Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, who thought the film could be uh, used as a good platform for discussion in many New England towns and cities about issues of gentrification, uh, community organizing, consensus building, and uh, basically the ways in which class background uh, it interacts with all of these topics. So I decided to videotape the tour uh, and the people I met in each community as a way to bring back to Lewiston the stories of struggle and victory from our neighboring towns and cities to, uh, to make the dialogue go both ways because, of course, we all have a lot of great things to learn from each other. The first stop was in Jamaica Plain where I met the organizers of JP City Life Vida Urbana. Here at City Life, we become more than just a, a, a tenant organizer. We become your friend, your sister, your brother. Well, right now, through the foreclosure issue, uh, we have, yeah. I would say, over 100 people come in on a weekly basis. This is where you get your training to speak out because the bank, they want you to be quiet, they don't want you to fight back, and they don't want you to say anything. They just want you to take whatever they send and get out. We try to tell them what the legal rights are in terms of uh, staying in their homes and also we begin to develop a strategy to pressure the bank to start negotiating with them. People are not asking for bailouts, they're asking to continue to pay their mortgage based on real value. And banks are getting billions and billions and billions of dollars of bailouts and they're not even doing anything, any, any real remodification of the loan or the, or the principal. Uh, the movement part is making these facts public because the banks agree to negotiate only when they feel that kind of public pressure. We demand that Wells Fargo listen to the voices of our members and negotiate fair and affordable modifications. These foreclosures and evictions are ravaging our neighborhoods. They're leaving properties vacant they are putting people at risk for homelessness. The next stop was in East Boston for a showing in the community room of a public housing project. Uh, East Boston is an island, majority Latino, lots of people from other immigrants from all over the world and uh, other people who have been here for generations. <laughs> Dozens of people in the neighborhood right now that are fighting their individual evictions. One uh, recent victory was a, a group of tenants that live on Monmouth Street. They were being evicted by Citizens Bank. They fought their case. Uh, they were over a year in their apartment without paying rent, and uh, they managed to get a settlement from the bank for uh, $12,500, plus uh, got their rent lowered and repairs made, and they stayed in. A lot of the times the banks will just try to give you some money to move out, uh, but these guys um, were able to uh, succeed, you know, and kind of go beyond their expectations about what they were able to get. In Troy, I met Amy, who told me about Troy's development history and the city's urban renewal activity in the 1960s and 70s. They were, there were two separate projects that would connect. There was the north-south north -south arterial that was going to run from the Menans Bridge to the unmade Hoosick Street Bridge here. The arterial would meet up with the bridge, apparently, and come down that way. All of the houses got torn down for that before they did any land surveying to see that 
it's on a hill, <laughs> and everything, it's, it's not geograph geographically sound yeah. to put a road on it. But they, um, but they tore everything down. They tore everything. Like, uh, never mind. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was all about the demolition contracts. Like, so there was a hole in the ground, you know, and then they didn't have any money to build. A hundred people showed up to protest this. This is 1967, huge protest. There was nothing wrong with the building. We're ten blocks above the river now, and that's where the the highway was going to land with a quarter mile clover leaf onto the city. Yeah here it would have landed right on this house it got scaled back to a much more modest chunk of concrete two blocks down so it lands on the city at 8th street and a lot of houses were saved from there i got a lift with mike and don who brought me to brattleboro where i spoke with richard about food justice issues in his town so there's a strong local food movement in the area but it's largely a middle class phenomenon so we're looking at ways to make it spread and to not be a classist movement. We started at a middle to low income community and worked with a local farmer. So instead of selling to the Brattleboro Food Co-op, which then marked it up and didn't make it accessible to her neighbors, she was willing to sell it in a CSA fashion on a weekly basis, delivering it to the housing area. Next, I spoke with Karen about a group of tenants who have organized to take control of their housing. And what they wanted to do was purchase this large housing complex where they lived that was going on the market um, after, I think it was about 25 years old at that time, 20, 25 years old. And so they banded together, they formed a tenants organization. Forever now, starting in 2009, these residents have essentially the final say on anything that happens where they live. They're going to see this film, folks, and uh, I, I hope they take a lot of heart from it and get a lot of ideas. And on behalf of them, I wish you the best in your struggles. The next day, the video was shown in a community center in Turner's Falls, which was developed with block grant money to serve the teenage population, who, in the mid-90s, had found very little in the way of positive after-school opportunities around their small New England town. I was very jealous, as Lewis and Auburn is probably about eight times the size of Turner's Falls, but still has no such teen or community center. Well, here in Worcester, um, about a year and a half, to get um, a city ordinance into play inside City Hall. They kept tabling it and tabling it for the simple yeah. fact is that, you know, they thought a whole bunch of convicts wouldn't be able to change laws or change city ordinance around or come together like the young lady was mentioning to, to make changes here in the city of Worcester. That's why it's so great to see this room right here to, tonight. We're hoping together to learn uh, how to address the struggle and Nothing better than to unity. So, Sex Buster is a youth led cooperative business, non profit organization, and we have 10 youth and we deal with lead in the soil. Perennials, gardening, um, patios, we raise beds. Janice Serrano, she has a huge backyard that she didn't know it was lead contaminated. Her brother went to the hospital and they said, Oh, your brother is diagnosed us with lead. And then she was like, Oh my God. So she talked to some people and said, okay, lead is a big problem because her friends were, you know, experiencing that about their siblings and all that. So she um, got people together. So that's when the Toxic Story Buster um, came in to say, okay, if the government's not doing anything, we're going to try to see if we can help our neighbors, if we can help our community. We also do community organizing, like dancing, helping with um, save our pools. Neighbors to neighbors, we do a whole lot of stuff. I learned how to speak more in public. And before I used to be so scared just to even talk to people one on one and where to get people's attention and I really learned that and I'm so glad that I have. So now I'm not even scared to even talk to people. No matter what level you are, I'm just there to talk to you. That's any any last things you wanna say? I love CSB. Finally, I arrived in Providence and spoke with Dania about organizing people who live in public housing. On the 80s, uh, HUD decided instead of have stuff that is public or the buildings are public to be sold to private owners, 
and HUD give the, the money to start those projects and basically subsidize those projects. But it was a contract of 20 or 30 years. So at the time of the expiration of the contract, they could definitely just sell the building like any anybody else, you know, if they get out of the contract. But what that means is a lot of people will be from project base to regular Section 8, and Section 8 is already full, so it's very hard for them to accommodate um, in that. And then the buildings are basically gentrified, you know, they've been sold as condos or just for profit. Afterwards, the film was shown, and I talked with Bruce about his work at D.A.R.E. Well, we are a grassroots member-based organization uh, who fight oppression in, uh, on all realms. We, we fight social justice issues uh, based on what comes out of the membership. Prison Committee is what I work on now. It's been around for 10 years, and there was a coalition of groups working on this, this ballot question in 2006 for people to you know, restore voting rights for, uh, for convicted felons who were on parole or probation. And um, you know, we went door to door and we canvassed. Uh, you could really make that human connection. You know, white, black, Latino, rich, poor. We went in all sorts of areas and, and they would share stories that you just didn't even expect. And where we did our organizing, you know, we focused on the, the six cities of, of, of Rhode Island. Uh, we won by 15,000 votes and where we didn't organize and left it to just the mainstream media or some story or, you know, press release we can get out there, we lost by, I think it was 9,000 votes. So we became the first state uh, ever to actually re-enfranchise people through popular uh, ballot. On the ride home to Lewiston, I thought about all the great work that's being done. Then I wondered why, if you know, if there are so many hardworking people trying to create a just world, are there still so many problems and obstacles at the same time? And one thought was that, uh, you know, after every victory, we set the bar higher, sort of continuously pushing for a better world, and naturally feeling like we've never done enough. Uh, but then I thought, you know, we're all doing the best we can in the context of a long legacy of power struggle and oppression, and it will take that sort of never-ending persistence on the part of organizers to slowly upset the systems that perpetuate inequity, but it's just not the kind of thing that happens quickly or even in one's lifetime. And then I thought about how uh, I don't really know that much, period. Uh, which is one reason why I guess I like to make videos because with video I get to meet all kinds of people and give them a platform to share their wisdom. I learn and, and they share. And then together we get to write our own stories. We get to honor the real work and victories that have been achieved, but we also get to construct images of the way we want the world to be. We can play with time and escape even even when just piecing together real images and stories to a world where regular people are the celebrated heroes and suddenly the progress can feel more real, uh, more attainable in our lifetimes and have a really, really good soundtrack playing in the background.